Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hope all the live sites can hear. Um, I have pressed record, so we are recording. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming um, and everyone watching all over the southeast as well as you guys here um, live in Atlanta. Uh, we like to start our meetings um, by by stating our mission. Um, our mission is to emulate SCCM's mission, which is to secure the highest quality care for all critically ill and injured patients in the Southeast region by providing educational and research opportunities, as well as promoting multi-professional collaboration. Um, so again, welcome to our um, over 80 viewers from all over the Southeast region. I know we have live sites uh, tonight at Baptist Memorial in Memphis. We've got Erlanger Health System in Chattanooga, TriStar Centennial in Nashville. Um, I've got folks at UAB in Birmingham, um, UK Chandler Medical Center in Lexington, Baptist Health Medical Center in Little Rock and Grady Hospital in Atlanta, as well as here at Northside Atlanta. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming and watching. Um, we also want to say thank you to our sponsors this evening, uh, Nestle Health Science, Allergan, Merck, and Fresenius Cobby. Thank you guys for your support and continued support of the Southeast chapter. Um, quick announcements before we get started. Of course, CE credits are available for tonight. Uh, we have one hour of credit. Uh, that includes physician, nursing, pharmacist, and dietitian. Um, so you can complete the eval within, 20, uh, within two weeks, excuse me, by November 27th. Um, and if you, need, um, if you need that link, you can always email us at communications at sccmse.org. Um, and we can send you that link or we had the QR code flashing up here um, before the meeting. Uh, most of the sites also should have a little printout for you if you need that as well. Um, a couple other uh, announcements and upcoming events. Our next meeting will be held on March 12th in 2019. Um, Dr. Hodge from Grady Hospital's Burn Center will be talking on burn management in the ICU. So that will surely be an interesting topic and hopefully we'll have some awesome pictures uh, with the burn folks. Um, anyone attending Congress this year, um, the SCCM Annual Congress will be held in San Diego, California, and our chapter meeting during that will be on Monday, February 18th at 2.30 p.m. local time, local Cali time, um, and the room will be in the Omni Hotel Grand B room, um, so we'll hope to see you there if you're going to be in, uh, in San Diego this year. Um, and final announcement, um, save the date also for the Southeast Critical Care Summit um, coming up on April 18th. 2019, which will be at the Emory Conference Center Hotel, um, and more information on that can be found at criticalcaresummit.com. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce tonight's speaker. Um, tonight we have um, Dr. Patel, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine on um, the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin, um, where he cares for the critically ill patients, he teaches and also conducts research. Um, he also serves as an associate editor for Nutrition and Clinical Practice Journal, and as well as a current um, Aspen Critical Care Section Chair. So please join me um, in welcoming Dr. Jayshil Patel. Thank you very much. Um, can you guys all hear me okay here? All right. You know, I'm hoping to turn this into more of a discussion, but before we start, um, thank you to the organizing uh, committee for this invitation. I'm just happy to leave the snow behind for Atlanta. <laughs> Adina mentioned that uh, the city shuts down, so I was happy to leave it behind <laughs> as well. So uh, today we're gonna talk about updates on the use of uh, early exclusive and supplemental PN in uh, the critically ill adult. And here are some of my objectives. Um, really, we're trying to describe guideline recommendations for the use of exclusive and supplemental PN in critically ill adults. But more importantly, we want to try and identify and appraise, and that's the key word, right? Really appraise new landmark randomized controlled trials comparing um, early EN versus early exclusive PN. And we're going to do the same thing in objective three of early EN versus with supplemental uh, PN. And then we'll sort of think about some scenarios where it might be of benefit to your patients to use exclusive and supplemental PN. Um, at any point, if you feel like you, know, you want me to repeat something, if you have a question, you know, chances are somebody else in the room has the same question. So please stop me. Okay. 
Okay, and we'll see if we can just have a discussion more than anything. And so let's let's sort of uh, frame our discussion on this case right here, right? So consider this case. This is um, not unusual by any means. We have a 60-year-old man uh, with a history of esophageal cancer. He was admitted after a witnessed aspiration leading to pneumonia and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and septic shock. This gentleman's had a poor oral intake and a 10-pound weight loss over two months. His BMI is down to 19. So far, he has received about three liters of intravenous fluids and his blood pressure is 120 over 50, but he did require some norepinephrine as well. And he's on 0.1 mics per kg per minute. Okay, here's a question just to sort of think about as we move on. And again, I don't um, necessarily need people to answer it, just sort of think about what you would do because I'm not sure if there is a right answer necessarily. So where do you deliver nutrition? A, enterally at full dose, 25 kilocals per kg per day. What about a trophic dose, 10 to 30 mLs per hour? Parenterally at full dose, both parenterally and enterally. Or E, I don't, and that's okay too. So just have a look and then we'll move on. So here's what guidelines tell us. I'm sure you guys are sick of guidelines at this point, but here's what guidelines say so far about the use of EN versus PN. And these are the three major societal guidelines, um, starting with the Canadian critical care guidelines on top. And in red, what they say is that they recommend the use of EN over PN. And so do the SCCM Aspen guidelines, and of course, so do the European guidelines as well. But then people might ask, well, what's really the role of parenteral nutrition in my critically ill patients? And so to give you some broad strokes, I've sort of tailored it down into two large categories. The first one is when EN cannot or will not be provided, right? You can't use the bowel or you have a provider who says, I'm just not gonna use the bowel for whatever reason. And the second one is when EN is providing insufficient support. So for the purposes of this talk, Number one, we're gonna call exclusive PN use. And number two, we're gonna call it supplemental PN use. So let's sort of focus on question number one here is, what do I do when EN cannot or will not be provided? Now, the case I showed you certainly may have um, brought up a few reasons why EN could not be provided. And so if we look at exclusive PN, there's this concept of nutritional risk that we'll get to later. But for now, the guidelines tell us that if you have somebody with what is called a low nutritional risk, we should probably withhold exclusive PN over the first seven days. And if you look at the second recommendation based on expert consensus, in those with a high nutritional risk, we should probably initiate exclusive PN as soon as possible following ICU admission. And what was that based on? That was based on two large meta-analyses that were done, one by Braunschweig and one by Highland. Here I've showed you the data from Braunschweig. And if we follow the arrow up, you can see in the subgroup of individuals who are malnourished. So how do they define those people? They define malnourished individuals who had a 10 to 15% weight loss with reduced oral intake prior to their ICU admission. So when they compared studies of EN versus PN exclusively in the critically ill patient early, there was no overall difference in benefit, but indeed there was a difference if we looked at malnourished patients in terms of complications. And what complications are we talking about? We're talking about things like development of pneumonia, not being able to get off the ventilator and such. And we'll expand on this concept of nutritional risk later in the talk. So what new randomized controlled trials inform us for using exclusive PN in critical care. Now, I didn't want to show you observational data. And the reason is, is because we're supposed to make inferences from literature. And the strongest inferences we can make are from randomized controlled data. And in fact, the guideline that we're updating um, right now is utilizing just randomized controlled trials to make adjustments to the 2016 guideline. And so the two 
large randomized controlled trials that inform us for the use of exclusive PN in critical care is the calories trial, which is there on top. And the one below, which is a little bit newer, it's the Nutriria 2 study. So I don't know how many of you have seen this format, but if you look at the yellow uh, letters there, P-I-C-O, this is called a PICO question. When we appraise studies for therapy, we asked for P, who are the patients? I, what is the intervention? C, what is being compared? And in my mind, the most important one is, what is the primary outcome? Because in randomized control trials, in general, the sample size estimation is for a primary outcome. So here's the question that was being asked in the calories trial. In critically ill adult patients expected to require nutrition for at least two days, does intervention I with early PN as compared to early EN improve outcome of all cause 30 day mortality? Remember that outcome. This study was powered for benefit, not for um, equivalency. It was powered for benefit. So what do they do? Here's the design of the study. They randomized 1,200 patients across Europe. I think the majority of sites were in England to receive enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition based on the site's standards. So this was a pragmatic sort of real world design. What does that mean? That means they did not control for any other aspect of the study. And the only thing they randomized to was whether the person would get EN or whether the person would get PN. And in fact, they did not even ask the sites to use a specific formula of EN or a formulation of PN. It was whatever was at your site and what you did. So a real world design. The power of this real world design though allows for external generalizability. If they can do it in the real world, so can we at our institution as well. Did this for five days, okay? And so the question to always ask is, well, who are the patients, right? Here are the patients. The patients were in their 60s, uh, fairly sick. When you looked at their Apache 2 scores of about 70 and their SOFA scores of about 10, these scoring systems are used to say, how's my patient gonna do um, uh, as a consequence of being critically ill? But if you look at the fourth row there, excuse me, the fifth row, I guess, the vast majority of patients were not malnourished. And the BMI was under 30 in the, in the vast majority of patients. And from the second from the bottom, the majority of these patients you can infer were medical ICU patients, because only about 13 to 14% underwent any sort of surgery. And of course, the vast majority were mechanically ventilated. So looking at the patient population is important because we want to say, does it match my patient population so I can extrapolate information? And here are the outcomes. If you look to the left, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. It shows for that primary outcome of 30-day mortality, there was no difference between randomization to early PN or early EN. However, if you look at the outcomes maybe of interest there was significantly more hypoglycemia in the early EN group. There was significantly more, much more vomiting in the early EN group as well. However, that did not translate into serious adverse event differences between the two groups. And that is row number five there, okay? But keep this in mind. So here's some take home points from the calories trial. Again, no difference in the primary outcome of 30-day mortality using PN, about 33% mortality, which is sort of what we expect for individuals who have those Apache 2 and SOFA scores. Despite the increase in vomiting and hypoglycemic events, there was no serious adverse events that were reported. Now, here's what's interesting in this study. The caloric targets were not met in this pragmatic, real-world design. How many of you struggle with meeting prescribed calories. Yeah, I see a lot of people, you know, so do we. And so if they can't meet caloric targets in the framework of a randomized controlled trial, that tells you a lot about what to expect at your local institution. And the take home point here is that really early enteral, excuse me, enteral nutrition through the parenteral route, early nutrition through the parenteral route was neither superior nor inferior 
to enteral route. Now, if you notice the wording there, I didn't say equivalent, okay? Because the study was not powered for equivalent. You might look at the Kaplan Myron curve and say, well, there's no difference between the two. Powering studies for equivalency requires a lot more patience. So here, all we can say was it was neither superior nor inferior to the enteral route. But I think it's gonna be a safe option when again, EN cannot be provided. And in this patient subset, I really wonder if the individuals who received early EN or early PN actually benefited. Because as you saw, the vast majority, 90% plus, were okay in terms of their nutritional status. So what does that mean now in terms of, in the context of other EN versus PN trials? Well, this is an updated meta-analysis. And if you look at this forest plot at the arrow, um, when we add the Sheila Harvey calories trial in there, we see that, again, there's no difference when we look at just caloric intake uh, in terms of mortality outcomes. But when they took this trial out and they looked at how many calories an individual was getting through PN versus EN, they found that if you were getting more calories through PN, then maybe that actually favored EN. And the, the rationale for this was that maybe these patients were getting overfed when they were getting more calories. So this showed a signal, but again, this didn't include the Harvey study because they didn't parse out, you know, exact number of calories in this trial. So let's get back to our case for just a second. So that was our first look at use of exclusive parenteral nutrition and the calories trial. But let's get back to our case here for just a moment. So our gentleman has received three liters of IV fluids and his blood pressure is 120 or 50. And this might've caught some of your eyes, which is, well, this guy's on norepinephrine. How many of you feed people on vasoactive support? Yeah. How many of you feed a full dose? Yeah, many people kind of shaking their heads as well. What doses do you use, if you don't mind me asking? Does it vary? 10 or 20. 10 or, an hour, maybe. 10 or 20? Okay, I think that's reasonable. Well, this is what gives some people angst. It does at our institution, especially when the norepinephrine dose might be escalating. And so what we're dealing with is circulatory shock. And the idea really here is, is that in shock states, you have this reduced splanchnic blood flow. And so here's the conundrum. The conundrum is, what do I do? Do I give luminal nutrients or do I not give luminal nutrients? And you might say, well, why, why even bother causing you know, harm if there's reduced splanchnic blood flow? If we look at the guidelines, the recent surviving sepsis campaign actually says, suggest early trophic or hypocaloric or early full EN in critically ill patients with septic shock. Those are disparate recommendations, aren't they? <laughs> So that was really confusing. And not only that, but if you look at early trophic versus hypocaloric, those are disparate recommendations. And the reason why is because early trophic is just a fixed number, as you all know. It's just 10 to 30 just to maintain the quote unquote trophic function of the gut. Whereas hypocaloric certainly does reduce the calories from glucose, but it maintains protein. And a lot of our patients inadvertently get what is called permissive underfeeding, where you reduce calories from fats, glucose, and protein. That's not what this recommendation is saying. So this posed a lot of confusion for many of us. And so we kind of had to go back to some of the basics. Indeed, enteral and parenteral nutrition provide these benefits, right? They provide calories, they maintain mitochondrial function, through those calories, protein synthesis can be augmented at what stage of critical illness, I'm not sure. And they certainly may help enhance muscle function through provision of protein and other calories. But enteral nutrition really maintains gut integrity, it reduces inflammation, and it maintains gut immunity as well. And how does it do that? It does that through crosstalk. So if you look at the figure here on the right, there's significant crosstalk between the intestinal epithelium bacteria and the immune system. But the idea really is, is that if you follow along here, reduce contractility and leads to some bacterial overgrowth. And those bacteria are likely to adhere 
to enterocytes. So the absence of anything in the lumen will allow those bacteria to stick to the enterocytes instead of being propulsed forward. And then they undergo what's called contact-mediated apoptosis. So the enterocytes lose their function and they undergo apoptosis. And the tight junctions now become looser. And macrophage activation ensues. And what ends up happening is the dendritic cells underneath the enterocytes recognize an unfavorable luminal environment and release a cytokine storm. So this is why the gut is thought to be sort of the motor of perpetuating inflammation as well. And that's what leads to this multiple organ failure that we observe in our critically ill patients who come in with say just respiratory failure and two days later they have kidney injury, they are in multiple doses of vasopressors, their liver might be injured as well. And so some might say, well, look, there's a issue though still with reduced splanchnic blood flow. And I agree. Here's sort of a cartoon showing that. The artery and the vein and the small intestine run in parallel. So the arterial blood flows upward towards the tip. But oxygen ex is extracted from the base to the tip. So by the time blood gets to the tip, there's really no more oxygen to be extracted in shock states as well. And if, if you remember, blood is shunted away from the splanchnic circulation prior to that. So that leaves the villi susceptible to hypoxia. And there's this concern for what is called non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia and non-occlusive bowel necrosis. So by introducing nutrients into the gut that is in shock, you hypoperfuse the bowel because of what is called a splanchnic sort of steel syndrome. And these are some of the most grave consequences of a hyperperfused bowel. So individuals started saying, well, maybe we can use parenteral nutrition when EN will not be provided. So again, the gut function is okay, but someone sees the norepinephrine or phenylephrine doses going up and saying, boy, I don't know, but I need to get nutrition to my patient. And so maybe we can do parental nutrition. And hence, the Nutrivia 2 study was developed. Again, in that same format, what is the question that they were asking? They were saying, asking, in the critically ill adult patients receiving mechanical ventilation for at least 48 hours, this is what it took to get into the study, and vasopressor support, does intervention with early parental nutrition, as compared to early enteral nutrition, improve outcome of 28-day all-cause mortality? Again, power for mortality benefit. And here's what they did. This was another one of those pragmatic real world design studies. This was conducted predominantly in France, 30 some sites in France. And they said, you manage the ventilator the way you want. You manage your shock the way you want. The only thing we're gonna randomize patients to is whether they get enteral versus parenteral nutrition. Those who got enteral though, the GRVs could not be, could not be monitored and PN could be added at day number eight. These are the same authors, um, Rainier was the author on this, that did the randomized trial showing the lack of benefit of checking gastric residual volume. So they implemented that into the methodology. The parenteral group, they were on that until they were off vasopressors for 24 hours and their lactic acid was less than two as well. And so who are the patients? Well, here they are right here. What you can see in the last column there is that the vast majority, about two thirds, were septic shock patients. And the majority of these were medical ICU patients, fairly sick. The SOFA scores are 11 as well. And then here are the outcomes. Now, if you look at the mortality difference, there was none. There was no difference between giving somebody early enteral versus early parenteral nutrition, those individuals who were in shock. But look at the rate of bowel ischemia there was significantly more bowel ischemia in the enteral group. These were patients who actually had to go to the operating room and had their bowels either uh, uh, resected or, or, um, or not for that matter. But they also had significantly more colonic pseudo obstruction as compared to this group as well. So I went back and said, well, why did this happen? Why, why did this happen? And so let's look at um, column number three for just a second. Right? Etch that into your mind for a second. They gave about 
18 kilocals per kg per day. And in the PN group, they got almost 20 kilocals per kg per day. So I went back and looked at all of the observational data. Most of this, actually all of it is from the surgical literature. And what we can see is that the incidence of non-occlusive bowel necrosis was rare. It occurred in less than 3% of cases. And the vast majority of these cases, these patients were getting NJ feeds. So they were bypassing the pylorus altogether. Pylorus is supposed to be smart, right? Not let anything in if there's something going on in the small bowel. And if you look at the last study, the Marvin study, four out of 13 patients were on vasopressors. That means nine of them developed this without being on any sort of vasopressor support, or they were perhaps not in shock, is another way of saying that. And then I looked at our randomized trials. And if we look at our randomized trials that included people who were on vasopressors, I'm gonna go through a few of these with you. This was the calories trial. And if you scour through the supplement of the calories trial, if you look at the vasoactive patients, look at this, about 80% were on vasoactive support. And ischemic bowel was not observed in the EN group in the same frequency as it was in the Nutria 2 trial. That's there. And similarly with serious adverse events. This was the redox study. Just to get into the redox study, this is a study that studied glutamine, right? This, just to get into the study, you had to be on vasopressor support. And when I looked at the supplements, patients were getting about 80% of their EN uh, on, a, on EN. They had three days where they were in shock or on vasopressors. Their mortality, there was a difference, but look at the ileus and non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia rates. One in each placebo and antioxidant group. So why did this happen in Nutrivia 2, but we didn't observe it in previous studies of enteral nutrition where they did receive vasopressor support? So the last study I'll tell you about is one that's sort of hot off the press. And this came out uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and this was the target trial. And if you look at the target trial, look at the first column under in that red box there, about two thirds of patients were on vasopressors there. Now, this trial compared high density enteral nutrition to standard enteral nutrition. So one and a half kilocal per ml versus one kilocal per ml. And in doing that, about two thirds of patients were on vasopressors. And 80% in each group needed a vasopressor up to sometimes 20, at some point during the 28 days. And if you look at their vomiting or large gastric residual volumes, that's 10 patients, not 10%. It's 10 out of 1,900, five out of almost 2,000 patients, and one had bowel ischemia. So again, three other large randomized controlled trials where patients were on vasopressor support did not develop non-occlusive bowel necrosis or mesenteric ischemia. But Nutria 2, significant the greater number of patients. So let's get back to that for a second. Look at this. How many of you would put your patients on enteral nutrition at a dose of 18 kilocals per kg per day, right? 17.8, when they're on 0 0.5 mics per kg per minute of norepinephrine? Any hands in the room? No risk takers? Yeah. Neither would I. I think this was a problem with this study, is that they were effectively pouring gasoline onto a flame. In some institutions, and perhaps at yours, that's a ceiling dose of norepinephrine. That's a whopping dose of norepinephrine. Now, at our institution, we go as high as five mics per kg. You know, and some our VA go as high as two mics per kg. Um, but I know some that go as high as 0.5 mics per kg before they add a second agent on as well. And so these were sick patients, right? Super high doses of norepinephrine and let's give them something right into their gut. So I, I really wonder if we were adding gasoline onto um, a flame there. So here's some take home points for the Nutria 2 study. There was no difference in the primary outcome in mechanically ventilated patients with predominantly septic shock. Yes, there were more adverse events in the early EN group and adverse GI events may be related to dose rather than route as the early EN group received about 18 kilocals per kg a day without GRV monitoring. 
So we certainly need more data to compare the different EN doses in hemodynamically unstable patients. But this does lend additional credibility to parenteral nutrition being a safe option when EN will not be provided, right? Will not be provided. So someone's saying, gut's fine, but too much norepinephrine, you could use parenteral nutrition in that scenario as well. Okay, let's get back to the case. So this gentleman uh, remains on norepinephrine at 0.1. I took your advice. He started on trophic EN at 20 mLs per hour within 24 hours. Next question, when and how do you get the patient to goal nutrition dose? Starting day three using PN, starting day seven using PN, over the next 24 hours using EN, over the next 24 hours using PN, or you don't kind of let them sit at trophic doses as well. So have a look at these answer choices. So here's what we're talking about now. Now we've shifted and we're saying, what do we do when EN is providing insufficient support? And let's look at the data for supplemental parenteral nutrition. Now, back to the guidelines for just a second. In patients who have low or high nutritional risk, and we'll touch on that in a little bit, they actually recommend supplemental PNB considered after, excuse me, seven to 10 days. Parenthetically, this is because of the APANIC study and the negative results of starting early parental nutrition in the APANIC study. I have my qualms with the APANIC study. One of them is that um, these patients were in the ICU for about three days making me wonder if they really needed aggressive nutrition to begin with. The second thing is that the vast majority of those patients were post-op cardiac surgery patients. Doesn't apply to my patient population. The vast majority were not malnourished uh, patients. And they use something called 20% dextrose. You know, that's taboo in our ICU. Do you guys use that? Yeah. And so not generalizable, at least here. But this was a recommendation. So what do we have since the recommendation? What are some new randomized trials for supplemental PN in critical care? The top one is called the EAT ICU uh, study, and that came out of the Netherlands. The one below is called the Top Up study. This was um, a Canadian American, I believe, European uh, consensus collaboration, excuse me, as well. So this will tell us a little bit about when do we add supplemental PN? Now, I'm only including studies since the last guideline. There were previous trials, like the SPN study, which I'm sure you've heard of, and this was incorporated into the guidelines. I'm just giving you the new data here as well. So let's look at the EAT-ICU trial. So here's the question that they asked. In mechanically ventilated, critically ill adult patients expected to stay in the ICU for more than three days, right? Does intervention with early goal-directed nutrition, and I'll define what that means in just a moment, using EN and PN for at least seven days, compared to early EN alone for seven days, improve the outcome of a six-month, what is called the physical component summary of how well you're doing, okay? This is a large uh, inventory, and one of the components of that inventory is a physical function. Enteral nutrition alone, and they use weight-based uh, calculations for seven days. And the goal-directed, what they did there was they used indirect calorimetry on admission, and then every day thereafter to maintain energy requirements. And they try to get these guides to their goal uh, energy requirement. So who are these patients? Now, if you look, this one's, these patients are uh, probably half-half. About half received emergency surgery, about half were medical ICU patients. They were fairly sick individuals. It's not our BMI that we see uh, in our ICUs. Uh, and then the mean, mean age is, is right there with uh, other studies as we saw. So if we look at sort of the measured energy requirements in row number one, you see that they were a little bit greater in the early goal-directed group. But then when we looked at the calculated, interestingly, you know, only about a, a hundred point difference between the measured and calculated for the early goal-directed group. And so it tells you maybe the value or devalue of in indirect calorimetry as well. And similarly, the measure protein requirement was uh, higher uh, in the early goal directed versus the EN alone group as well. And so here are the results of the study. When they asked people, how are you doing with your physical functioning at six months? 
no difference in the primary outcome, whether you got early, aggressive, get you to your energy expenditure using IC with EN and PN versus EN alone. And no difference in 28-day mortality or 90-day mortality. Now, the key differences are where the arrows are. You see on trial day one, the early goal-directed group, of course, had less in terms of uh, cumulative energy balance deficits. But by day seven, those margins were closing in as well. So if you look overall, you could maybe say that there was probably a 400 to 900 kilocalorie per day deficit in the group that got EN alone, right? Just keep that in mind for just a little bit. Now, interestingly, the cumulative insulin dosing was much greater in the early goal-directed group as well. So here's some take-home points for the EAT ICU tr trial. Early goal-directed using supplemental PN to get there, okay, for seven days did not reduce six-month physical component score. And did also didn't reduce your secondary outcomes of 28-day, 90-day, or six-month mortality. And what the authors concluded was that using supplemental PN as part of it resulted in better calorie and protein delivery. But this was a small single center trial. And when we think about what kind of outcomes we want, if you're delivering more nutrition for seven days, right? 400 to 900 kilocalories per day, more nutrition for seven days, then what sort of benefit are we looking for? What's the biologic plausibility of delivering 400 to 900 kilocalories for seven days and six months later asking somebody, hey, how are you doing with your physical functioning? Do you see the disparity uh, there? And so again, I really wonder is does a small difference in calories over one week impact a six month outcome? Here's the top of trial, okay? This was also a trial looking at supplemental PN. Let's top it up with some parenteral nutrition. And here's what they asked. In critically ill adult patients with a BMI of less than 25 or more than 35, that's interesting. They're actually looking at people who may benefit from supplemental parenteral nutrition. And mechanically ventilated for 72 hours. Does intervention with early EN and PN for seven days as compared to EN alone for seven days improve outcome? Now, this was a pilot feasibility study. They were looking to see a, can we do this with an international collaboration? And B, will it improve the delivery by 30%? Okay, so this was not powered for mortality or other sort of hard outcomes. But this was very intriguing because they were looking at individuals who may benefit, right? So trying to really whittle down a population who's gonna benefit from supplemental PN. So what do they do? They randomized about 70 patients to EN alone and about 50 patients to EN and supplemental PN, both for seven days. Who were the patients? Well, here we go. Now, according to their Apache 2 score, they were fairly sick. But if you look at their SOFA score, which is the third row down, uh, not as sick as, as expected. And they actually looked at their Nutrix score, which I'll touch on just a little bit as well. And for the entire cohort, the mean Nutrix score was under five. Remember, five is that cutoff value for the modified Nutrix score as well. About half were medical uh, patients. And the Charleston's index tells us about their comorbidities. What kind of comorbidities do they have? The greater the number, the more comorbidities they have. They were fairly matched. Excuse me. And the Barthel index um, tells us about their level of independence. So it asks questions like, can you groom yourself? Can you bathe yourself? Can you feed yourself? A score of 100 means that you're fully independent, right? And then it's a continuous variable, and so you can fall anywhere there. These patients were pretty close to being fully independent. And so what do they find? Well, what they found is if we look at the last two rows here, the group that got supplemental PN, where they topped it off, they got to 95% of their prescribed calories over the first seven days. And they got to about 85% of their prescribed protein over the first seven days. And when they looked at it, looked at these patients for a total of 11 days, 
and you see that there is really not a significant difference in their calorie prescription. That's the fifth row down as well, nor are their protein prescription. But here is an interesting subgroup, a priori defined, of course, analysis. Look at these arrows. The black bars tell you hospital mortality. If you had a BMI of less than 25 and you received supplemental PN on top of your enteral nutrition, look at that striking difference in the hospital mortality and the ICU mortality for that matter. When they stratified based on the Nutrix score, right? How nutritionally risk are you? Patients who have a Nutrix score or five or greater are considered to be at nutritional risk. Again, they found that if you received greater amount of nutrition in the first seven days, then there was a signal there. Again, take it with a grain of salt. It is a secondary outcome in terms of reducing hospital mortality. So maybe we're starting to identify people who are really going to benefit versus taking this heterogeneous patient population and saying you get EN or you get some PN. And so the concept of nutritional risk is based on two things. An individual from the time that they hit the ICU, right, day zero, they could be coming in with some form of malnutrition. Perhaps it was unrecognized or under-recognized. And the way that many of us uh, evaluate is using the SGA. But patients who then are exposed to critical illness, why? Because critical illness, the synchrona of critical illness is protein loss. So one thing I always say is that if you were to starve yourselves voluntarily right now, the order of, of nutrient depletion would be glucose, fats, and protein. But during critical illness where there's heightened inflammation, body thinks it's going to war, needs immunity, needs protein for wound healing. It's glucose protein and then fats. And so critical illness exposes individuals to nutritional risk. And so how do we identify that? Well, if we take a step back, this is kind of what I said, if you starve yourself, that is this line right here, you could slowly become severely malnourished, which is this red line right here. But if you are critically ill and you come malnourished, you can get there much, much faster as well. Here's one way to do it. This is the Nutrix score. Here are the components um, of the Nutrix score. But the reason I bring this up is really, um, and I'll get to this in just a second, is because maybe we really need to identify a patient population that's going to truly benefit from our nutritional interventions. And I'll get there in just a second, and I'll tell you about a study that's, that we're doing right now. But let me stop and uh, look at the top-up trial take-home points for just a second. When patients received EN and supplemental PN, okay, it did increase their calorie and protein delivery during the first week of critical illness. And in those patients who were malnourished defined as a BMI of less than 25 or had a nutric of five or greater or nutritional risk, those patients had a trend towards improved ICU and hospital mortality as well. And I'll start with this word right here and studies comparing SPN and ENTN alone in nutritionally high risk, right? Using nutric or a BMI cutoff, or something else like a frailty assessment or a sarcopenia assessment are certainly warranted. And that brings me to this. Many of you have probably heard about this right now, um, but this is the effort study. And the effort study is looking at doing this exactly. It is looking at identifying which patients are going to qualify, not, excuse me, benefit the most from higher doses of protein. So, they're taking a registry-based format that we're looking at randomizing, enrolling 4,000 nutritionally high-risk patients, BMI of less than 25, more than 35. We're using sarcopenia indices. We're using frailty indices to enroll these individuals and randomize them to more than 2.2 grams a day of protein or less than or equal to 1.2 grams a day of protein. And we're looking at a primary outcome of 60-day uh, mortality. This is a um, multi-center, pragma again, pragmatic design 
uh, registry-based trial. And if any of you um, would like some more information on the trial or would like to get your site up and running, um, here is some additional information um, for you to take home with you uh, as well. Okay, let's look at some learning assessment questions. All right, there's five in total. All right. Which statement best describes current guideline-based recommendations for use of exclusive PN in critically ill patients? I won't read these. I'll let you guys take a moment, read them, and then I'll just kind of get a show of hands as to answer choices. Okay, A. B. Okay, C, D, okay, let's take a look. So remember, exclusive PN, when EN cannot or will not be provided, should be initiated as soon as possible in the patient determined to be at high nutritional risk. Again, um, this was based on those two meta-analyses. Uh, I showed you the subgroup analysis for malnutrition from the uh, Braunschweig study. Okay. All right. What was the primary question answered in the calories trial? Okay, so I asked this um, not to be trite, um, but I want to make sure we understand what the question is, right, before we try and look for the answer. Take a moment. Okay, A, okay, B, all right, C, okay, D, all right, let's take a look. The reason why this is really important, and again, emphasize this enough, is when you read these trials, ask, excuse me, what is it that they're looking for? So here, they were looking explicitly for an improved 30-day mortality. So they weren't saying PN is equal to EN at the onset and generating a sample size estimation from that. They were saying, hey, we think PN is better than EN and we're generating our sample size from there. And the reason it's important is because the inferences you make from these results are going to depend upon what's the question. Okay. Okay, what was observed in the Nutria 2 trial, which compared early enteral nutrition to early exclusive PN in mechanically ventilated patients with shock? Need some Jeopardy music. <laughs> okay, A. All right, B's. C's. All right, D. Okay, great. Again, this was powered for mortality. They did not observe a difference in mortality. Remember, about 33%, but there were significantly more GI complications. And we're talking about serious adverse events, non-occlusive bowel necrosis, pseudocolonic uh, obstruction in those individuals who were in shock, who received early enteral nutrition. Again, uh, certainly editorializing here a little bit, but I wonder, again, if we were throwing you know, gasoline onto a flame because of the norepinephrine dose. Okay, two more. This one's a little bit shorter. What was the primary outcome in the EAT ICU trial? Okay, A's, this was the one where they used indirect calorimetry on day zero and then every day to do early goal direct nutrition, remember? Okay, B, great, C, and D. Okay, reason I ask this question again is um, not to be trite, but 
it's important we look at what our outcomes are. What do we want nutrition to accomplish, right? And if you are finding a disparity or biologic implausibility between that what which was studied and that what is the outcome, I would advise you to remain skeptical before you implement it into your practice. Okay, last question here. What outcome was observed in the top-up trial? Again, this was BMI of less than 25, more than 35, randomized to EN versus EN plus PN. Okay, take a moment. Okay, A, B, C, and D. Okay, excellent. This was a pi pilot feasibility study. They wanted to make sure they could do it, and they wanted to see if they, by doing it, they can actually del increase delivery of uh, calories and protein. And indeed, they did increase delivery as well. I remember the subgroup analyses had. Uh, a trend towards ICU and hospital mortality in those who were at nutritional risk, right? Nutrient score of five or greater, and those who had a BMI of less than 25. Thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation to speak. So now we'll take um, any questions either here or we'll see if we have any questions from anyone else. Anyone here at Northside? Yes, Fatima. Um, the complication that you mentioned with the um, early enteral nutrition, uh, particularly the bowel complication, why the complication was not uh, reported? Because we know so far that early EN is good and particularly maintaining the structure of the bowel. So why was it, it was not reported before? So let me just... Re uh rephrase the question and please stop me if I'm uh, paraphrasing it correctly. The question is why was the bowel, why were the bowel consequences not reported? Are you asking if they were not reported in the study? Yeah, yeah because we knew from these studies that the, uh -huh. the early enteral nutrition maintains the structure of the yeah. GI and that yeah. is why we will start it earlier. Yeah, so let me just try and separate the question into into two things Um, and, and I hope, hope I answer it if I don't please let me know, okay? Um, they were giving full dose early enteral nutrition to a patient population that was very vulnerable to developing such complications. So number one, they, they reported all their complications. It's in the manuscript, it's also in the supplement as well. Um, but by introducing full dose early enteral nutrition, the benefits of maintaining trophism was not met. And in fact, the harm of gut ischemia was actualized. And I think that happened because these patients were on almost a ceiling dose of norepinephrine. So you're correct. It does maintain trophism, but when trophism tips into complications, and why does that happen? In this particular study, I wonder if it was because they were on way too much vasopressor to safely allow the gut to actually do its job. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I think also, just to kind of, I think maybe you were asking some of the earlier data that showed a benefit with the early EN. Right. So maybe even years ago, why were they not reporting some of these issues with right, exactly. with the intolerance and all of that. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, those earlier studies that were done were not conducted in patients who were in circulatory shock. So the circulatory shock phenomena um, is was the most evident, at least in the surgical population. So all those observational trials I showed you there, um, those were the ones that really reported and the vast majority of those patients received NJ feeds as well. So, and if we look back at even our other randomized control trials, they didn't report the same complications, but they also didn't report their norepinephrine doses, okay? 
the, the, the study that reported the norepinephrine dose, the Neutrovia 2, was because its premise was based on, let's see what happens in shock. Um, let's see. Looks like we have a question from the webinar. Um, the question here says, what are your thoughts on supplemental PN in the large burn ICU patient, and how long would you continue given prolonged ICU stay? I don't know if I have a definitive answer for that one, but here's what I will say. I will say that in the burn population, uh, one of the ways that PN can be used is to optimize protein prescriptions. Because we do know that in the burn populations, these patients are gonna need upwards of three, three and a half grams per kilogram per day. And if you can't achieve that enterally, then certainly uh, IV amino acids is a manner in which we can actualize your protein prescription. And um, there are newer enteral formulations that have greater amounts of protein, I believe 80 to 90 grams per protein, but that probably won't even cut it uh, in the burn population. Yes. Yeah, I wonder if you might comment on the differences between medical ICU and surgical ICU patient populations. And this, this uh, scenario. Um, so which specific scenario are you referring to? Well, you, the surgical intensive care unit patients uh, many times come in with trauma or yeah. they may not be malnourished when they come in. Medical ICU patients many times have chronic diseases. You know, you're absolutely right. There are, yeah, absolutely. The question is, um, can, you, can I comment on the differences in the use of exclusive and supplemental PN in different populations, surgical versus medical. Um, so you're right, in the surgical population, specifically the, the trauma critical care populations, these patients um, don't necessarily have the prevalence of pre-existing malnutrition. They are younger as well, but that doesn't mean they're not gonna acquire nutritional risk. And so the manner in which we dose our protein and, and perhaps even our non-protein uh, calories might be the same after day two or three in that population because that's where the Nutrix score was, was developed to say, can we use supplemental, uh, optimize uh, delivery with supplemental protein? So I would say the risk stratification is going to be the same. Now, our studies haven't necessarily bore that out because they're heterogeneous uh, uh, populations as well. And um, if we look on, if you look on clinicaltrials.gov, the second largest study that's enrolling right now for protein dosing is in the United States, and they're looking at a trauma population. So they are studying specifically the trauma uh, population, prospective randomized control uh, trial as well. And then in terms of exclusive parental nutrition, I would probably say the same thing, is that um, I think we have at least enough data to say that it can safely be done, especially when it cannot or will not um, be used. But again, if you have a low risk population, then perhaps some of those patients can forego parenteral nutrition for many days, probably a week. Don't see any more questions on the webinar. No more questions from text. Any other questions here? Okay, yeah, go for it. Um, maybe this is too early to ask. Um, because we are practicing the evidence-based guidelines, even when we feel like as a dietitian that we are recommending starting PN on a patient who is kept NPO for days and days, but still the doctors don't want to do that because of the risk of the infection. So is it is um, will we see soon that there will be some guidelines on using the supplemental PN in these kinds of patients? Yes. Yeah, so. We're working on updating the guideline for exclusive and supplemental PM right now. And all of these trials that I have showed you will be included in those. Now, specifically the calories trial, um, as well as the Nutrivia 2 trial, um, I think we have large enough numbers to now say that there probably is not going to be much of a difference in terms of downstream infectious complications. And I think a lot of that's also because of the way we manage our catheters uh, these days as well. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, and at this time we'll conclude the webinar. Thank you.